A, sorry to have left you waiting if you've been waiting, but let's talk about the second half of Daisy Jones and the Six. So for me, this is episodes seven through 10, because I covered the first half episodes one through six already. So if you haven't seen the conversation around the first half and are interested, definitely check it out because it covers a lot of the kind of groundwork and exposition of the season and the shape of the season, because that is what, you know, establishing episodes often do. But here we're looking at the second half, the back half, the tour, so to speak because we didn't really get that first tour in the same way that we did in the book, which we talked about in the first half as well. So the second half released in two episode chunks. And in the interim, I was trying to fall in love with the music because they did release the Aurora album from Daisy Jones and the Six. And I am kind of notoriously a sucker for music in television shows. So I was trying to really feel the connection to this music because so much of the mythos of the book and the show center around around the idea of the emotion in this music and how the music transcends. And while in that first half we really got the intimacy of the creative process, even if I don't think it went as far as it could have, we were supposed to feel the emotional charge of these songs. And I admittedly wasn't connecting emotionally. So I live in Chicago. I walk a lot of places. I take public transportation. I listen to music a lot on the go. So I put on the album for a walk and and within a song or so, I actually found myself admittedly moving on to, of all things, Gimme Shelter by the Rolling Stones. But at the same time, I don't think of all things because that song has an emotional charge and desperation that I was searching for in the Daisy Jones and the Six music. And it wasn't getting me there emotionally at first listen. Ironically enough though, and a perfect illustration of how subjective all of this is, I was on the bus later, not the same day, but you know, kind of the amorphous later, and saw a girl in front of me listening to the Daisy Jones and the Six album. So it is resonating. And I found myself kind of asking myself why it's not resonating for me personally. And I think the second half of the series helped it resonate more because here is where we're using the music and the stage presence to kind of tell the story more. And the book has always been, and granted, of course, we're not seeing the stage presence in the book, but the book has always been about filling in the gaps, filling in the empty spaces. And sometimes that filling in is imagination and subtext. Often it is. And so I actually thought that the last episode of the season was the most impactful for me because I loved how it was cut to show what we were seeing on stage at Soldier Field, how these people were interacting on stage together, and then cutting to the behind the scenes. Now, of course, we'll get to what we were cutting to, but to stay on the music for one moment longer, I've been seeing a lot of buzz, and I think I alluded to it in the first video as well, around this idea of the music and the music transcending the series in some way. And I know I saw an interview, I can't remember which actor the interview was with, about how when they auditioned, they had to indicate whether they would be willing to tour or not. And they obviously went through band practices, band rehearsals, which makes sense in terms of the verisimilitude of those scenes. And as a dramaturg, I was very happy with that. Now, as a dramaturg, though, I am also very interested in this idea of touring. And I've seen lots of people kind of speculating on whether or not Daisy Jones and the Six is going to tour. And I've also seen some online theorizing on whether they may debut this in Chicago, specifically around Lala, which would be kind of the easiest to maneuver. And I find this super fascinating. And why I find this interesting dramaturgically is because as a dramaturg, I am always interested in extending the conversation of the work beyond the immediacy of the performance time and space. And so what is a work saying? And this is kind of expanding that world and blurring the lines of fiction and reality. So it's a cool kind of thing, taking something fictional and making it real, but it also then begs the question of what the lines are for real. And in the book and the series, part of the appeal of this band is this dynamic between Daisy and Billy on stage, this kind of not knowing exactly what is going on between the two of them, 
but how that energy can kind of create something charged and magical. How does that translate outside of a fictional narrative? Do you uphold and maintain the fiction of it, or do you move into a more realistic space? And we're already kind of blurring the idea of fiction and reality within the show, obviously, because we are approaching this as the kind of interview format, which, like I said in the first half of my kind of analysis, and to be clear, that first half I hadn't seen the second half of the show, I was so, so glad that they kept this format because I think that that is what makes the book so interesting. But I also think it is one of the challenges of the translation to the screen because in the book you have all of this that is being said, but it's also about the subtext of what isn't being said, reading between the lines, seeing how different people's kind of recollections and perceptions either gel or don't, or the kind of dramatic irony of knowing something from one person's point of view and not from another. And here in the series, as I've said before, out of narrative necessity, we kind of have to pick a central truth and portray that. And so we have to kind of centralize the story in some way. And I think a little bit that centralization is not quite clear. We're not really sure what the center of this story is. Before we dive into the second half too, too deep, I do want to say in terms of the interview style, the music, kind of going back to that dramaturgical inkling that I'm kind of viewing a lot of this through, I would be fascinated to see this adapted for the stage. Because I think that there, I have said before, I love a memory play. And I think that this is perfectly primed to be a memory play. We have the interview kind of style and impetus. And of course, that would be a challenge and we'd have to play with that and knowing when the twist, if we keep the twist, comes in and how to portray that on stage. But I think that there would be something so interesting and so powerful in seeing these actors move in and out of the memory, kind of have to grapple with the memory in their present selves and embody that. It would also be less of a suspension of disbelief on the audience's part in terms of the age difference of the actors if it's the same actor embodying that character throughout. Out. And I just think the immediacy of the space and the more condensed storytelling would serve the piece and amplify the emotions and the resonance. Because I think spreading it out, I've talked about pacing in relation to Shadow and Bone, and I think we had similar kind of challenges here and that the pacing was just a little lopsided, or the fact that the storytelling wasn't as centralized as maybe it could have been helped the pacing feel a little off or caused the pacing to feel a little off. Because we spent a lot of lead up in the first half of the series and it felt like a lot a lot of that kind of fell by the wayside in the second half. And I think one of my critiques of the first half of the season, this kind of restraint we were seeing, that kind of unwillingness or inability to go to that full emotional messiness came to fruition here because instead of things feeling like they exploded, it was kind of an implosion, like a slow internal collapse. And I think that there is something interesting there, especially when you have this kind of band living the high life, living large, everything being sparkly on the outside. And we see that sparkle. And I love getting to see that sparkle because we talk so much about these characters finding their voice, particularly Daisy and Simone, and this search for a voice and claiming the power of that voice. But we hadn't really gotten to see it because we were so focused on Billy and Daisy. And to a large extent, we still are. And so this relationship kind of overpowers everything. Even as we are planting these seeds of this idea of these two being broken half, and later we get that moment from Daisy where she says she doesn't want to be broken. But we also have that moment, I believe, from Nikki where it's talking about them being a mirror and so kind of facing the worst bits of yourself. However, we're not really seeing the worst bits. Now, does this mean that it wasn't emotionally impactful? Absolutely not. I thought the last episode really hit a lot of that emotion, especially seeing Billy break down on stage, Daisy break down on stage, those moments where they connected, those moments of connection between Daisy and Karen especially were incredibly powerful for me. But there was still this holding back, I felt, from the season. And I do wonder if part of it, I've read some articles, and I haven't read full articles to be completely clear, but I've read some buzz around where season two may go and whether to expect a season 
season two. And I think we are in this really interesting narrative moment because we have this opportunity to tell stories like this on a grander scale. Because whether or not the season felt a little spread thin over 10 episodes, or it didn't feel like it fully developed to fit those 10 episodes completely, it still needed that room, I would argue, more than like a movie. Now I know that I argued also that we could develop this for the stage, but there's a different level of immediacy and a different kind of storytelling there. And we will unarguably be getting a different story if we tell it on the stage in a movie versus on the screen. So we have this space to kind of explore these characters. Now do I feel like we fully explored them? I don't think so. I think we were still being kept at arm's length, which makes sense in terms of these characters holding something back. If we are seeing this action as a reflection of the interviews, maybe, and what these characters are willing to tell Julia, which we know now that it was, in fact, still Julia interviewing them. So maybe that is the lens we are supposed to be considering everything through, especially when Billy says there's still so much you don't know. But we are also seeing so much that I don't know would have been part of Julia's purview, even within the interviews. Like, yeah, they'll allude to things, but I don't think we would have seen the fullness of Billy and Daisy to the extent that we did if we were viewing this through the lens of something still being held back. And I believe through the storytelling medium, this being a TV show, we as an audience or audiences don't have that same expectation that something may be held back. I think we would have needed to make that a little bit more clear to the audience. Now maybe that is part of why we didn't see Billy's full breakdown. It also may have been partly to make that final breakdown more impactful because it was, but we weren't really seeing the full extent of what Billy was fighting against and for until that final episode, which made the conflict the rest of the season a little bit harder to grasp onto. That emotional resonance wasn't as deep. We saw more of the kind of yearning, searching Daisy in the second half, especially in relation to her relationship with her mother, which I thought was incredibly interesting. We were seeing a young woman searching for belonging, searching for a home, searching for family, which makes that moment at the end when Daisy says, I really love this one that much more impactful. But we didn't see that as much in the first half of the season. We didn't see her finding that camaraderie in the same way because we were so focused on her and Billy. And the Billy Daisy dynamic was admittedly a little hard for me to grasp onto here. And I mentioned before that infidelity plot lines are pretty hard for me. But I went into this knowing that this was an emotional infidelity plot line. However, the kind of connection between Billy and Daisy didn't feel as firm to me here as I wanted it to. And again, part of that resonance, especially in the book, is you're bringing the baggage of all of these other mythos to the table. There are these stories that are told that live in the silences and the spaces. And here it felt like we were both being trusted too much with the spaces and not enough. Too much in that I think that there was a lot that was honestly underdeveloped and not enough in some of the more heavy-handed shots, pieces of dialogue, and honestly kind of plot maneuverings. The fact that Daisy and Billy have some kind of physical consummation here, and to be clear I'm simply talking kisses here, but it was treated as this kind of emotional culmination in a way that in the book the art and the music was the emotional culmination, and so we had this kind of release of emotions in some ways. It kind of took the tension down even as I was personally going like, oh no. Especially because in that moment we did get to see Daisy kind of stand her ground and find her voice. But the kind of maneuvering of Camilla, especially in the second half of the season, was really disappointing for me, I'm not gonna lie, especially because it felt like the first half of the season was doing so much legwork to give her a voice and complicate her. And I did like that it leaned in a little bit to that complication of we both messed up. I don't like necessarily that her kind of indiscretion with Eddie ended up being used as this moment between Billy and Eddie. I get it, but it felt like something that was just hers and she doesn't have much that's just hers. And it was also notable because in the second half of the season, we lose her interviews. So we lose her perspective into this situation. And to my first watch recollection, we really don't see the other characters talking about her either. And sometimes, honestly, those interviews felt a little bit more monologue-y than interview for me here, which 
give or take. But we lost that perspective from Camilla. And in the book, we see her as a fighter. She's fighting for her marriage. She's fighting for the life that she has always wanted. Whether we agree with that or not isn't the point. And there is this steely compassion. And I really missed the final kind of interaction between Daisy and Camilla in the book. We have a kind of version of it in the show, but it's not the same tenor at all. I do think that they probably switched it a little bit to kind of show more agency from both Billy and Daisy. In that I mean in the book we have a Camilla who is fighting to save her marriage, fighting for Billy. But in the show we are seeing a Billy who has to fight for Camilla, who has to make a choice. And in that choice and in that maneuvering I think it is supposed to give more agency to our characters but it also takes Camilla's agency away and it turns her into the muse that Daisy never wants to be. She becomes this kind of idyllic representation, especially with the end of the season and kind of sticking to the book in Camilla getting sick and kind of giving her blessing to Billy seeking out Daisy, which I believe, and again, I haven't read an article about a season two, if it happens, would be the kind of focus of a season two, a kind of reunion tour of sorts, which I think that there is strength in knowing when a story is over. And we are in this place where so many stories don't get the space to tell the story as they want to tell it, which is impacting the art in things like Shadow and Bone. But here, I think we had the space to tell a complete story. And then we have the opportunity opportunity for that story to kind of transcend in this idea of the band existing beyond the fiction of the show. So there is a lot of really interesting exploration there, but I don't know that a season two is really necessary, especially as we've tied a neat little bow on a lot of these characters' lives. But I just really hate that this neat little bow includes killing off Camilla, because we have a show where we know Billy and Daisy aren't good for each other. We know they bring out the kind of raw wound in the other, and maybe I have less patience for it because I'm less likely to romanticize a showman's. I don't know. But there is something very intimate in the creative process. That's undeniable. But for me personally, I don't know that that intimacy fully translated. And instead, in the second half for me, it really felt like it shifted focus onto Daisy more specifically. And I think that that is where we lost a lot of this other storytelling, particularly with Camilla. But we also lost other pieces of the story, particularly with Graham and Karen. Because we did see Billy's breakdown here, and it was emotionally impactful, but we had a moment with him and Eddie, the kind of fallout with Eddie. And I do like what they did with Eddie's character here. I think in this case, the restraint kind of worked because we had this building to this kind of final moment. And in theory, either of those characters, Billy or Eddie, could have been right in that moment. It's just that kind of clashing of artistic perspectives and this idea of this slow growing resentment and this idea that Billy is not seeing what is around him. So as selfish as Daisy is called explicitly in the show, Billy's selfishness is really only called out to my recollection in the kind of abstract and kind of showing him as a mirror for Daisy. But he is even more selfish in some ways and him trying to cling to this idea of being a good man and having this perfect life and what that means pushes this selfishness in some ways. And that falls by the wayside a little bit. And one of the ways that that falls by the wayside and could have been integrated more into the season, I think, is the relationship between Billy and Graham. And even Billy says it in the last episode where sometimes he forgets their brothers. And I think the series forgets their brothers a little bit. And in the book, there's this kind of reckoning where Graham is always there for Billy when Billy is breaking down. And Billy isn't there for Graham. And the show doesn't even really give Billy the opportunity to be there for Graham. They never have this kind of brotherly heart to heart and this face off. And I think honestly, the show chickens out a lot in terms of Graham because his relationship with Karen, the plot hits the beats technically here. We have a pregnancy scare and we have an abortion. Quick bit interlude because I realized I didn't really say everything I wanted to say about Karen specifically within the season and her storyline involving her pregnancy because I think that there was something incredibly powerful in keeping that storyline in. To be fair, I don't think that we can remove it, but I also don't think that we can overlook these storylines, especially in a post-Roe world. We have a character here who is unapologetic in her choice and her desires and knows she doesn't want a child, and she takes care of that without questioning herself. And we feel as an audience kind of removed from Karen 
in this decision and we obviously don't get the full kind of fight around this decision between Karen and Graham. It's much more silent and a kind of silent breaking as they realize that there really is a fork in the road here. But in some ways I do wonder if they pulled back on that storyline to not make Karen and her body a battleground because while there was still a real tension around this moment and this development and this decision, it was still very much rooted in these kind of differing desires and differing visions for the future. So while Graham's kind of cruelty in some ways and his emotional tempestuous was reined in, I do wonder if that was a more specific choice. Now granted, it was a choice nonetheless regardless, but the kind of impetus behind that choice. What I also appreciate is that we keep this relationship between Karen and Camilla kind of central. And I think that this is kind of some of the most dynamic we really get to see Camilla in the second half, but I think that there is something incredibly important and profound in their ability to communicate without words in that scene where they kind of just share a glance and know this intuition, this sense that Camilla can see what this means to Karen, and the fact that we know that Camilla values motherhood and her identity as a mother and really encourages people like Daisy not to limit themselves based on their own experience with their mothers, but she also recognizes Karen when she says that she doesn't want to be a mother and doesn't try to change her mind. Rather, she meets her friend where she is and helps her. And I think that that was incredibly important. And I think that seeing those moments, I think the moment where Daisy really leans on Karen in the hallway and on the keyboard, because in the final performance, we can sense Daisy sensing something in Karen and kind of returning that gesture in some ways. And this moment of camaraderie and kind of leaning on each other, I think that there is something very powerful in that. And I really, really enjoyed when the series really leaned into those friendships, particularly the friendship between Daisy and Simone and the kind of idea of calling out the ones you love. But again, I just didn't want to ignore the power and importance of that storyline, Karen's storyline and Karen's pregnancy within the series, while also feeling like the emotional fallout of all of that could have been developed a little bit more. The sureness of that decision in and of itself and Karen's complete trust in her vision for her future cannot be oversimplified. I think it's really important. So while this is probably still an oversimplification in some ways, I did want to call out that importance. And we have the tension between the two of them based on this idea of uh, this family life that Graham wants, whether he's willing to articulate it or not, and Karen wanting the rock star life, wanting to continue to be an artist and to get on stage every night and knowing that if she has a child, she has to give that up and it's her sacrifice, never his. And it kind of bluntly articulates that, but it never then goes into the more subtle emotional intricacies of this relationship and how it falls apart based on this kind of conflict. And we do have the one moment at the Soldier Field soundcheck where Graham tells Karen that she's gonna be alone forever, which is very much Taylor Swift's all too well, casually cruel in the name of being honest. But we don't fully delve into the kind of subtle douchebaggery of Graham, but how he feels very vindicated and righteous in those feelings and exploring the complicated nature of him being entitled to those feelings while not being entitled to take that anger out on Karen. And and it really explores the ways that toxic masculinity can seep into even otherwise nice guys and the ways that we can wound the ones we love the most when we're hurt and the ways that we lash out. But then it also circles back to that isolation and not taking that opportunity to give that moment of kind of vulnerability between Billy and Graham. That moment where Billy turns away from Graham when he needs him most, when Graham has always been there for Billy and showing Billy's kind of selfishness in that way. And the second half of this season really does feel like it is about that kind of isolation and desire for connection in a lot of ways from the very first episode, which feels like this kind of pullback from everything in Greece, but I think is very important to the overall kind of focus of this second half. I was very, very excited to see Simone get a lot more in episode seven. I was excited to see it explore her relationship with Bernie. And I think it presented a really important contrast on the idea of love, especially in the second half, where we see at first Daisy fleeing kind of all of this emotional responsibility, all of this emotional baggage, but getting immediately entangled with someone else. How she's kind of a codependent personality type in a lot of ways and seeing her latch on to Nikki. And Nikki in the series was interesting because he was less emotionally volatile. He was a little bit more insidious. And in some ways I actually think that that really worked. I think that moment of him fleeing Daisy when she is in the shower was incredibly impactful. This idea that you are throwing 
everything at this relationship, this idea that Daisy hides herself in these relationships in a lot of ways and how she is losing herself. And then you have to ask the question, is she also throwing herself at Billy and losing herself in this idea of Billy? So it's really about all of these characters finding themselves and their voice in some ways at the end of the day. And it's about breaking them to build them back up, though we don't really see the building. And we don't fully see a full breaking either in the sense that there are still moments where we really pull our punch. The relationship between Karen and Graham, Teddy surviving, and what that does to the dynamic. I think it was this idea that it would like kill the momentum potentially or break the characters a little too soon. But like I said, we don't really see the build back up. We see the after. We see down the line. We see the 90s version of all of these characters. But especially kind of circling back to taking Camilla's voice away in some ways. Like, yes, we give her her voice in terms of telling Billy to find Daisy. And I think where her voice is most impactful is in giving a message to Daisy, because in some way in those final moments, we are seeing Camilla give Daisy the message that she gave her in the hotel room in the book. And this idea that someone believes in Daisy and is rooting for her regardless of all of the rest. And the idea that that hotel room scene is kind of removed from the rest of reality. But instead in the show, we have a Billy who's straight up telling Daisy he's not gonna leave his wife for her. We have these conversations where they admit they want to be in a relationship together in some way. But what that means never feels defined. And I don't think it's defined for Billy and Daisy to be completely fair, but it feels too obvious. It feels like we are not exploring the nuance and the subtlety. And because of that, I don't think a lot of the nuance and the subtlety is fully resonating in other parts of the show. And I think a lot of that traces back to the show not being completely clear on its focus. And we see the focus kind of shift, I believe, in the second half, but what are we ultimately driving toward? And I understand changes from the book, especially in terms of kind of forwarding and centering some other central idea. And there are definitely things that have to be changed just from the nature of the storytelling. But what is the ultimate story we're trying to tell here. I do like that in the second half, we get to see a little bit more of the scope of their success, especially those shots in Soldier Field, being able to see the Field Museum in the background. I do love a good Soldier Field shot. I saw the stones there with my dad a couple of years ago, was very pleased to hear the end of the series end on Shine a Light because the rest of the season I'd been like, where are the stones in this show about rock music? But being able to kind of see that and get a sense of Soldier Field at that time when I was getting, or I wasn't getting, Katie got tickets for Taylor Swift for us. Amidst that whole fiasco, my mom was telling me about the fiasco of trying to get Bruce Springsteen tickets for Soldier Field. So there is this definite sense of scale and scope to the place. Again, like I said before, I think a lot of the nuance of the season lives on that stage, seeing how these characters are interacting with each other, performing with each other. I think seeing little hints and pieces of the two are up to then gives us a sense of how this performance may be different. I think it could have gone even further, but I think think that the whole scope of the show or the scope of the book kind of exists in those moments. It's the behind the music, right? The intimate story, the secrets behind those glances and what do they mean and what is the emotional interior of these artists and how much does art reflect life? And especially within the second half, we get this repeated reminder that this is ephemeral, that this doesn't last forever, that these moments are special and how do we grasp them? And so obviously it does stem back to this idea of art, what exists in the popular consciousness, what stories do we build up around our favorite performance? Performers, what lives in legend, what specific performances kind of transcend the moment. And then also we get this glimpse in these interviews in the future about like the moment where Graham talks about hearing them on the classic rock station, the fact that these moments fade. So what lives, what transcends, and what fades into the next generation. And then at the end of the show and in the book, we have the reveal that it's Julia doing these interviews. So then you have to look at it through a lens of, okay, what story is Julia seeking out? What story is being told to Julia versus would be told to someone else. And I am tempted to kind of go back and rewatch the interview pieces and see what people are saying to Julia. And granted, I was paying attention to that on some level because I knew it was 
probably going to be Julia. But in the show, we kind of play with that. We have that reveal. We have these moments of connection. But what is it about it being Julia that this story is being told to and by that impacts things? What story is she telling versus the story someone else would be telling? So again, the framing of that story may be part of the reason for some of that restraint. But it feels like we really do have something that's being held back just a little. We have the glamour of this time. We have the sense of the time. We have these beautiful clothes. But at the same time, we're not getting all of the external and even internal that made these ephemeral moments so important to grasp onto. What is the buzz around them? What is the noise inside? What are they trying to drown out with this music? So yeah, I think that there was a lot to dive into with this series. I found it interesting and fun to watch, even if I felt like it could have pushed just a hair further in a lot of places. And I'm going to be very, very interested to see, one, if we get a season two, and if we do, what that is even going to look like. And two, if we see the music transcend the show here. And also, if we do push the music outside of the realm of the fictional, how that music resonates with modern audiences. So lots to think about here. I'm very interested in what you all thought of the season, thought of the characterization, the changes, whether they really worked for you and you felt like they furthered characters and plot points, or whether you felt they were a little lackluster, and what you think of the music, and what you think of the music's potential to live beyond the series. So let me know what you're thinking. Thanks as always for hanging out and listening to what I'm thinking. Like, subscribe, comment, all of that really helps. And as always, read something good. Maybe also put on Gimme Shelter this time. But yeah.